Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church at the Singing Bridge. And we are so glad you are with us this morning. It is a rainy morning, but it is bright to be in God's house and to worship together wherever you are. And we are grateful that you have joined us and hope that you will share at the bottom of your screen and let other people know that we are on and that we have gathered to worship this morning. Uh, many announcements today. We're grateful for Gracie C., who did our artwork this week, and it is beautiful. I hope if you haven't, you will go to the website and look at that, uh, and, uh, or Facebook. It should have been uh, posted, and I believe it was, and it is absolutely beautiful. So, Gracie, we thank you for your beautiful artwork this morning. Lenten resources are still available. They're available online, and they're also available here at the church in the supply closet immediately to your left when you come in the front glass doors. We hope you will take advantage of those and hope you are using those on a daily basis. A godly play for grown-ups. Listen again. Godly play for grown-ups. Beginning March the 11th, which is a Thursday, a week from Thursday, Reverend Amanda Standiford is going to lead a four-week experience, Godly Play for Grown-Ups, where you can experience or grow spiritually through a unique and wonder-filled approach to the great stories of our faith. Each of the sessions will start at 10 a.m. and be one hour or less, and you can go to our website for details. Again, our website is fbcfrankfurt.com church or .info or .org, any of those will get you to our website. And we hope that you will go and check out those uh, details, but hope you'll join us for Godly Play for Grown-Ups. March goals. As a new month begins uh, tomorrow, we're encouraging you to set a fresh goal related to your spiritual life and our church. We hope if you haven't, you'll uh, will join a Sunday school class, a virtual Sunday school class that you'll uh, be a part of our virtual Wednesday night Bible study or be in the Vroom Vroom Zoom for children or the Godly Play uh, groups. There are many ways that you can engage with First Baptist Church and grow in your spiritual life. We hope you will make it a goal in March to do just that if you have not already. We had a called business meeting this past Wednesday night. Thank you for all of those who showed up for that. There was a unanimous vote to proceed with installing ADA restrooms on the main floor of the Moffitt building. We are grateful for that. It is a major project and uh, we look forward to the completion of that project and our restrooms being uh, accessible to those with disabilities. Uh, vaccination support. We understand that some of this can be confusing trying to sign up for vaccine and we want to offer uh, help if we can. Our office manager, Amy, has agreed to assist if you call the church office during regular business hours, if you have questions or just need her to talk you through uh, signing up at a site, she will be happy to try and help you. So call the church office during regular hours if you are having trouble doing that. We still have yard signs and the temperature is changing. It's certainly different than a week ago. And it's time for people to start getting outside again. We hope you'll come by and pick up your FBC yard sign. Uh, there's a suggested $10 donation, but again, do not let that hinder you. If you would like a sign, please come and get one. Children and youth activities continue. There are virtual activities for both. And we hope you'll check the website out for more information on that or contact Amanda if you have a child or Marcus if you have a youth. Our financial update through February the 21st, our goal, 139,222, received to date, 105,210. We ask you to continue to remember the church and its myriad of missions in your prayers, but also in your support. And we thank you for your faithfulness uh, throughout this pandemic time. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We light the Christ candle this morning, reminding us again of his eternal presence. He is the light of the world, and we have gathered to worship. <laughs>
Scripture tells us that the creatures around the throne of God cry out, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty. We lift our voices and joining those around God's throne in proclaiming the holiness of God. Would you join as we sing together, Holy, Holy, Holy. In this moment, I invite you, as you're able to, to breathe in. Uh, good morning, um, FPC uh, family. I hope you all are doing well, as always. Um, before we get into our opening prayer, I'd like to invite you, wherever you're at, um, to uh, just quiet yourself, sit comfortably, as you're able to, and just to close your eyes for a moment. And in this moment, you may be thinking about all the different things that you have to do for today, for tomorrow, and for the week, or anything else that is running around um, wildly in your mind. And in this moment, I invite you, as you're able to, to breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. Just a couple more. And breathe. Let us pray. Good morning, God. Thank you for this day and this opportunity to gather together to worship. Proverbs 17, 22 tells us that a joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. 
In reflecting on this verse, I can't help but wonder what the condition of our hearts look like, along with our spirits. What are those areas where we feel crushed? Perhaps it's our constant wondering of when things will go back to semi-normal and our longing to be in each other's physical presence again. Perhaps it's our feelings towards certain individuals and the hardness of heart we formed around them, or vice versa. Or perhaps it's our anxiety toward what the future will look like. Perhaps it's something else. And yet, on the other hand, I also wonder what joy looks like and resembles in our lives as well. Maybe it's knowing that our loved ones are being vaccinated to safeguard against the coronavirus. Maybe it's taking a traumatic experience and using it as a means to comfort and care for others. Or maybe it's our acceptance of the opportunity to grow closer to you as the Lenten season invites us to do. Maybe it's something else. Whatever those things, these things are, may we bring them to you this morning in worship. May this time of worship be the good medicine that refreshes our hearts and spirits and prolongs our love and commitment to you. Amen. Will you join me in a responsive reading this morning? I'll read the light print and you'll read the bold. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart to revere your name. O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Then Jesus said to them all, If anyone become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Please join as we sing together.
Good morning. I am so glad to be with you on this rainy Sunday. Some stories about Jesus are fun to talk about. We like learning about times when Jesus came close to people and helped them, or when he told parables that invite us to wonder. Other stories about Jesus are harder. Sometimes Jesus does things that don't feel like they make sense, or maybe feel sad or worrisome. This is one of those kinds of stories. Jesus told his followers that he was going to suffer. They didn't like hearing this. Peter, one of Jesus' closest friends, told Jesus to stop talking like that. But Jesus told Peter that he was the one who needed to change his thinking. Jesus said that anyone who wants to truly be his follower needs to put their own wants and needs aside and take up their cross and go where Jesus goes. That's a strange and a hard thing to say. And I don't think Jesus meant that we should all get a big wooden cross and lug it around everywhere. So I wonder what taking up our cross could really mean. Maybe it looks like standing up for someone who's hurting, even if that means things might be harder for us too. I wonder if maybe it looks like giving up something we care about so that someone else can have what they need. I wonder if it could look like letting someone else have your turn when their need is bigger than yours. This is a hard story. It's fun to think about all the good things that Jesus does for us, but it's harder sometimes to think about what it looks like to join in Jesus' work. But it's important for us to do both, because both are a part of helping make God's dream come true. Would you pray with me? Loving God, thank you for inviting us into your whole dream, the good parts and the hard parts that make your dream come true. Help us to be people who put others first. In your name we pray. Amen.
Our scripture this morning comes from the book of Mark, chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. This is the word of the Lord.
Amen. Good morning. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, I pray that you'll take the meditations of my heart and the words of my mouth, and may they be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer, in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. I hope that you will turn with me to the Gospel of Mark as we heard chapter 8, verses 31 through 38 read. Very familiar passage of scripture, probably for many of you. Now, I'm not certain if any of the disciples would have accepted the invitation from Jesus to follow him if up front they would have fully understood that they would be following him to a cross. But to Jesus' credit, it's not too long into the process before he declares it as clearly as he possibly can. Verse 31, the beginning of our passage for today, says, He began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed. Verse 32, he said all of this quite openly. My point is, is that a lot of times Jesus may sound cryptic. And his parables take some time to decipher. This statement about how he must suffer and die is plain speech. About as straightforward as one can get. If the disciples didn't know what they were getting into to start their journey with Jesus, now they know. And we see just how serious Jesus is about it after Peter rebukes him. Some of Jesus' strongest recorded language is reserved within this context about the importance of what he just said about having to suffer and die. Jesus calls out one of his best friends and followers, Peter, basically calling him satanic. You are about as far away from God as you can get if you don't get on board with this, he was saying. Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. And Jesus doesn't stop there. After that exchange with Peter, he calls the crowds and the disciples and extends this idea of the cross to others. He declares, if any of you want to become my followers, you will need to deny yourselves and take up your cross and follow me. Essentially, Jesus was saying, yes, I'm going to have my own cross to carry, but in order for you to follow me or continue to follow me, you will have crosses of your own. Of course, Peter and the other disciples had different ideas about this whole messianic understanding. We've just seen where Peter takes Jesus aside and rebukes him for saying he would suffer and die. I don't know what Peter's words were exactly, but I imagine it, wasn't some, it was probably something to the effect of, Jesus, you can't say you're going to be Messiah and King in one breath and then say you're going to suffer and die in the next. It doesn't work that way. It never has. And if Peter said something like that, he wouldn't have been wrong. I mean, just a few verses earlier, beginning in verse 27, it reads, Jesus and his disciples went to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? And Peter answered, you are the Messiah. And then Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about this. In the Gospel of Matthew, it's interesting because we get Jesus' reply to Peter when Peter called him the Messiah. We don't get it in Mark, but we get it in Matthew. It says, in verse, it says, Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. So I don't blame Peter or the disciples about being confused. Messiah for the Jewish disciples has legitimate connections to prophetic words in the Hebrew Bible concerning a Messiah coming as king of Israel, not unlike King David. 
I don't blame the disciples because they've watched his miraculous healings. They've watched droves of people be attracted to him. But after this straightforward, plain speak about his future, about suffering, about a cross and death, this is where it should have taken hold for the disciples. But it didn't. One chapter and then two chapters over we find where they are arguing about who is the greatest among them and who will be seated in positions of power when Jesus ascends his throne. And if they didn't get it about Jesus, surely they didn't get the second part, which was about their own crosses. You think about their own self-denial, sacrifice, and what it would take to truly follow Jesus. So all of this leads me to a very important question for us, and that is this. Do we get it? I believe our answer to that question, both individually and collectively, will be the difference of whether or not we are or we become a healthy, beloved community. Understanding these words of Jesus, this passage from the Gospels, is foundational for constructing a beloved community. Because I firmly believe that individuals or groups will never truly understand what love is, until they understand that sacrifice and self-denial is the DNA of the love gene. God understood this better than anyone. And, And so to prove God's love for us and in some ways define love for us, what did God do? He sent his son. And while we were sinners, Christ died for us. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Ephesians that in order to walk in love is to understand how Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice. In his letter to the Galatians, he talks about how his life is defined by this sacrificial love. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me, who loved me by giving himself for me. The letter of 1 John may describe it best, and you hear me quote this scripture all the time. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. Therefore, we ought to lay down our lives for one another. Do we get it? Do we understand? If so, how are we incarnating this foundational principle to realizing our goal of having an authentic, beloved community of Christ? Jesus said, I'm going to have to suffer and die. But to what end? Now, we know the rest of the story, right? We understand Jesus was laying down his life as a ransom for the many, as he said himself. And we understand as God inspired the word through his apostles like Paul, who said the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And through John, as he wrote, Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for our sins only, but for the whole world. We understand what Jesus did on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, and what Jesus did to death as he was raised from death. And Jesus knows this in the context of our passage for today. He, under, he knows that. He's, he's God. He knows all of this, even if his audience did not. But in our passage, there is also something else being communicated by Jesus. And if we miss it, we will, we will miss a big part of our purpose and a layer of the many layers of understanding the cross. So Peter rebukes Jesus. Then Jesus rebukes Peter. Finally, he calls the crowd and disciples in close. And, and it's what he does not say that's interesting to me. He does not say, this cross I must endure for the forgiveness of your sins. Although, as I said, Jesus knows that, God knows that, and the world will soon know that. But in this particular space, Jesus says, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. In order to understand what it means to follow Jesus, we must understand what this life of Christ, that this life of Christ 
was a life of self-denial and self-sacrifice in order to build others up. And that's how you find your life, by losing it for others. You can gain the whole world for yourself, but you will lose the purpose of life. You see, if, if we want to create a love community, we got to first understand that the genetic makeup of love is intertwined with sacrifice, self-denial, and crosses. And as Amanda said, it's not easy, but love is hard sometimes. Many think that, that church is good if, if I'm entertained or I'm fed or I'm comfortable or I'm getting my needs met or that I'm getting paid attention to or that there's folks there my age or, or all matter of everything else. And, and that's really all about the self. And I realize it's difficult because we're saturated in a consumeristic culture and one that says, I'm going to get mine and literally to hell with anyone else. We're just saturated in that. So the church gets soaked in that as well. Jesus said, it's not about you. A cross is never about the one carrying it. It's about who he or she is carrying it for. The cross Jesus carried was not about him. It was about who he was carrying it for. It was sacrificial. It was love it was self-denial. It was the benefit of others. It was so we wouldn't have to carry that particular cross because he was the only one who could carry the full burden of sin. But Jesus was teaching them and in turn teaching us that basically the first thing we need to know about following him is that just like he carried a cross for us, we will need to daily carry crosses for others. Why is that? Because that is how we know we are his disciples, if we love one another. And that's the DNA of love. For God so loved the world, he gave his son. For who? For everybody who believes. God is love. God gave the most important thing. It was God's sacrifice for our good. Therefore, we ought to sacrifice for each other's good. Many today have what I call a theology of glory instead of a theology of the cross. For those of you who have studied the Renaissance period in history and how it connected to the church, you know that this theology of glory uh, was present in that time period as well. Uh, for those of you who have had the opportunity to travel in Europe, you've probably visited some of the great cathedrals, which are some of the most magnificent, magnificent structures on earth. And I've, I've had the fortunate opportunity to walk through some of those cathedral halls, and it's definitely worth seeing. During that time period, the church was riding on an all-time high wave of momentum. It had money, it had power, it had influence, it dominated culture, society, education, politics. At a moment's notice, it could summon armies to do whatever its biddings were, and its leaders lived like kings and were some of the most famous people on earth. The only problem was is that it was a theology of glory. It didn't match up with the Bible, with Jesus, or the theology of the cross. And so some brave clergy and laity alike began rejecting this theology of glory and began reading the Bible and getting the Bible into the hands of the people so that everyone could see the truth. That to follow Jesus was to lead a life of service to others and not to dominate them or control them or oppress them. And the greatest movement of the church outside of the apostolic period, in my opinion, took root in what is known as the Reformation. And it begins to infiltrate pockets of Europe and soon entire countries were embracing it. But it didn't come without a process. It didn't come without a price. Countless martyrs are found in hundreds of cemeteries and even mass graves throughout Europe. Love is hard. But theirs was the sacrifice 
for the sake of the gospel. They literally lost their lives for that purpose. But that's what love does. And that's what we must do for one another. And we may not be called to literally lay down our lives for someone else, but we are called daily to sacrificially love God and our neighbor. I've told you before, and I will undoubtedly tell you again, that Jesus was not only saving us from our sins, which I believe with my whole heart, but he also can save us from ourselves. This theology of the cross, if we can grasp that there are multiple layers to understanding the cross, not only for atonement, but as an essential principle of building the community of God that God desires, then I truly believe we can know the secret to healing our world. I often go back to the Gospel of John, chapter 8. It's my favorite story. It's a difficult story, but it is my favorite story. Where the scribes and Pharisees bring the adulterous woman to Jesus, rocks in hand, wanting to not only stone her, but to test Jesus. All sorts of evil going on. And I can't, I can't help but wonder if instead of picking up rocks... They picked up a towel and a basin. You see, it's hard to hold stones, let alone throw them, if you're washing feet. My point is, a people of God is built on love, which is sacrificial, not on judgment and condemnation. A beloved community is a self-denying, sacrificial collection of Christ's followers that is not looking to, to gain but to give. They do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others as better than themselves. They look to the interests of others because this is the mind of Christ, who himself didn't consider equality with God as something to be exploited, but made himself nothing. And he humbled himself. And what did he do? He died on a cross. Why? Why such a sacrifice? Because he wasn't looking to the interests of, uh, of himself, but to the interests of all of us. And we must do the same if we are to become what God desires for this collection of Christ followers to be. Otherwise, we're just a social club. We've got to do the hard things, and we've got to communicate these hard things, and we've got to work through them in order to grow. And that's where growth comes from. It comes through sacrifice. It comes through doing the hard things. And that's what we're called to do. Let's pray together. A gracious and loving God, thank you for this time together as a family of faith. And I pray that this may be a pivotal point for us as we move forward and discuss and realize what this beloved community is and what Jesus calls us to do. That love is not always easy, that it's sometimes hard. But in order for us to live out our purpose for one another and as a model for the world, as a light to the world, then we must carry our cross. And I pray that we will learn more and more on how to do that. And I pray your Holy Spirit may permeate our hearts and minds and grow us in this regard. Help us to make commitments today that honor such a message. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And that is the invitation to think about what commitments we need to make as individuals and collectively as a church to maybe reread passages such as this, to learn what Jesus says about being his followers and about creating beloved community, about agape, about sacrifice, about what it means to understand self-denial in order to build others up. 
maybe we can think about that this afternoon. If you have decisions, um, commitments that you want to share with me and the church, I'll be glad to receive those anytime. I'm in my office. You can call the office and we can certainly discuss those. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being a part of this family of faith. I sure do miss all of you and I pray that we will be uh, together in person soon as the uh, vaccines are being rolled out slowly but surely and we look forward to that great reunion of uh, First Baptist and uh, we certainly uh, will celebrate that in the coming months. God bless you First Baptist, you are the church so go be the church, act justly, love mercy and walk humbly with God. Our parting hymn is Share His Love. We sing the third stanza.